Okay, start it. Yeah, you can see the participant numbers are going up. 10, 11, 12. Okay, there's a split screen. If you click on participants, you'll see the list of panelists and the list of attendees. Yeah, All I'm right. monitoring that. Okay. For the early birds who have signed on now, uh, welcome. We'll give it a few minutes until uh, a few more, because we have quite a large list of people who signed up to this and I don't want them to miss the beginning. So be patient with us. We'll. Uh, We'll kick off in a couple of minutes. At least we've got, already got more attendees and panelists, so that's a good sign. Well, I'm, I'm tempted to say hello to all the friends who are typing their names into the <laughs> into the chat. Um, but uh, we're up to uh, 25 attendees, and we're expecting about 70 or 80 that we know of. Um, but not wanting to waste too much time keeping the early birds waiting, um, why don't I kick off and welcome you to this uh, webinar? Um, organized by the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, uh, that follows the publication of a, a recent report, which I hope some of you have had a chance to look at. Um, the author, Dan Stiles, is our first uh, speaker today. And what we're going to do is uh, uh, Dan is going to introduce his report, a sort of overview. And then we have a, a, a stellar panel of uh, Jenny Desmond from Liberia Chimp uh, Rescue and Protection. Um, Ophir Drury from the uh, Eagle Network, um, Patricia Trikorash, uh, formerly of the Cheetah Conservation Fund, but now more generally uh, working on uh, wildlife crime, in particular online wildlife crime. And, and I, as your host in Redmond, I, I chair the Ape Alliance and have been involved with uh, various aspects of illegal wildlife trade since, um, since 1976. Um, when I, I had the good fortune to go and work with <laughs> Diane Fossey, uh, studying and, as it turned out, uh, protecting uh, the mountain gorillas. And so that gives me a, a reasonable perspective of 40 something years. And during those early years at Kaisoki, one of the things that we faced was the threat of poachers being commissioned by outside agencies, criminal networks or individuals who wanted a baby gorilla. And the fact that we are publishing reports this year on the lack of action on that trade is really a sign of our failure. As a community of conservationists and animal rescuers, there are more sanctuaries across Africa than ever before looking after the orphans of this trade. And yet the trade seems to be going on regardless, almost bypassing all the efforts to stop it. So what are we doing wrong? And what can we learn? So to some extent, uh, Daniel's report has really poked a hole in its nest because people who have dedicated their life to combating the trade in, in baby apes and, and other species have to face up to the fact that we have not stopped that trade, haven't really even controlled it. And although it's not the only threat facing apes who also face habitat loss and being killed for their meat and for their body parts, for misguided medicinal purposes, it is one aspect of the trade, and it's one that there are organizations you would think would be active on tackling it, in particular CITES, the, international, the UN's Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. And yet at the last time 
we speakers were gathered together in person or virtually uh, last year at the uh, CITES 19th Conference of the Parties, um, we had a side event to talk about the illegal trade in apes, and it wasn't even on the agenda. So it's going on. There are hundreds of people dedicating their lives to picking up the pieces after the trade, and others who are actually engaging with the enforcement efforts necessary to stop the trade, and still the trade continues. So with those rather bleak opening re remarks, uh, I'm going to invite Dan to um, share screens, assuming the technology works, uh, and show us a summary of, of his findings in this report. Yeah, hello, everyone. Just waiting for the uh, PowerPoint to come up. It's not actually a PowerPoint showing point by point what was in the report, but it's an overview of illegal grade ape trade in general, and it will highlight some of the points made in the report. So, as I think most of you know, in the wild, African grade apes live in quite complex social communities. Uh, and the infant apes will stay with the mother up to 10, 12, 13 years old uh, for quite a long time. Next slide, please. Next. Well, I was told someone would be doing this. Okay. Uh, now, great apes have been traded since antiquity, mainly for curiosities and for entertainment purposes, but quite high rates of trade, organized trade started probably in about the 1950s uh, and increased throughout the 1970s. Up to 1975, there was really no international control on it. Uh, internationally, it was basically legal until CITES came into effect in 1975. And the main uses for great apes were biomedical research, cognitive studies to see how intelligent apes were, whether they could learn language. Uh, they were used on television. They were used sort of as, uh, you know, psychics, you might call it, in some of the early Hollywood movies. Uh, circuses was a very big use, and zoos were a very big use. And then they began to become more important in film. And quite a few more apes, mainly chimps and orangutans, were imported for uh, entertain, you know, the big screen entertainment. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. Now, the supply drivers of the trade are mainly habitat destruction, which unfortunately there is quite a bit in Africa going on. Great apes, of course, live in the tropical moist forests mainly of Central and West Africa. Uh, West Africa has one of the highest popula human population densities in Africa. So quite a bit of habitat fragmentation has occurred there. And not as much as happened in Central Africa, but it is happening. And now, of course, big plantations are starting up. And bushmeat hunting is one of the other main supply drivers because in both Central and West Africa, great apes have been traditionally a source of meat along with all of the other uh, mammals that live in the forest. And that produces orphans which you can see in the bottom right hand. Next slide, please. Now, orphans and trophies are what are side of collateral damage of the bushmeat hunting. And very often the baby apes will be kept in villages and Trophies will also be kept in villages in the hopes that some passerbys will maybe want to buy them. Next slide, please. So they're being hold, held in villages for quite some time until 
they might be able to sell them. And this occurred much more in the past than it does in the present because the great ape trading has become more organized and we now have traders. Next slide, please. Next slide. And the people who would buy the apes for local pets in the early days began to drive the market and traders came to realize, next slide please, that the local pets leads to local trade, organized trade. So the people who would be trading uh, bushmeat or even other products began to learn that they could buy the baby apes in the villages for very small sums of money. Next slide, please. Transform them to the larger urban centers where there were a lot more buyers and the trade just over time has been developing. Next slide, please. Until now you have professional traders and even capture teams that go out. In looking at the site trade database, doing an analysis, one of the things I noticed this is from some years ago is that from the beginning of CITES in 1975 to about 1990, the legal export and the seizures of the great apes was, was quite minimal. And suddenly after about 1990, we started seeing a lot more legal trade and a, a much more in the way of seizures. Trying to figure out what caused this leap. Next slide, please. Now, I'm not saying that King of Pop, MJ, Michael Jackson was the only cause of this, but he was the first one to really publicize having a chimpanzee pet. He traveled around the world with a chimpanzee named Bubbles. Now, actually, Bubbles was a series of chimps. Most people think it was just one chimp. The chimp, he, of course, would trade in for a younger one because older chimps are quite difficult to control and can be dangerous. Next slide, please. In fact, journalists are still writing about Bubbles. It's in a uh, Florida chimpanzee sanctuary. And now a lot of uh, celebrities began to be photographed with great apes. And I think this stimulated demand around the world actually with people who were looking for recognition, prestige. Next slide, please. And they started to, overseas, they started to buy apes as pets. Over, next slide, please. There, another demand driver were zoos and safari parks. In the 1990s, zoos and safari parks took off in Asia, the Middle East, places where they weren't very particular about how they obtained their animals. And uh, this stimulated the trafficking of the very young apes quite a bit. Next slide, please. And then when social media came about in the mid 2000s, traders and dealers and traffickers very quickly learned that this was an opportunity for marketing uh, the pet great apes. And it was also a place where people could show off their great apes. So sort of a dual effect of social media like Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. It was to stimulate demand and it was also, they, they provided platforms where the great apes could be advertised and traded. Next slide, please. So here we have the, just a very simplified trade chain. The trade starts with habitat loss, bushmeat hunting, from the hunting on one side of the trade chain, we get the dead adults and the uh, output of that is meat and trophies. But the live orphans also come out of habitat loss, bushmeat hunting, goes into local holding, local sale, 
down to international sale, sale for exotic pets and zoo entertainment are the primary uses. Next slide, please. And what's been happening in more recent years as private commercial zoos are starting up, wildlife parks of various kinds, they can call themselves rescue centers, rehabilitation centers, conservation centers, even sanctuaries, some of these do. But the, the, the crooked ones, I'm not saying they're all, they're all crooked and they all deal, but quite a few now are there only to trade and market various types of exotic wildlife and they act as sort of laundering centers. They bring animals in from all kinds of different sources, some legal, some illegal, but what, when they go out, they are sold as captive bred using CITES export permits quite often. And at the same time, the owners of these facilities can make money, you know, from fees, selfie photos, animal interaction charges, and they have restaurants and they can sell curios and that type of thing. Now, this is this is the current model that is really taking off. Uh, it's for, It's been fairly big in South Africa for quite a while. And now I'm seeing it in the Gulf states, mainly UAE, but also in South Asia. Next slide please. And they're like in the UAE, we have fixers. These are guys that are in government that will assist in bringing in illegal great apes and other wildlife to go to these wildlife parks. All these guys know each other. I've been following them all on various social media accounts and they're all one big happy family. Everybody knows everybody and everybody helps everybody out. And it's becoming extremely serious. Next slide, please. And some very wealthy people are involved in this. Very, very wealthy, powerful people. And I'm afraid that the people who are responsible for controlling this trade are just not taking it seriously. CITES didn't, e didn't even have a great ape uh, Agenda agenda item this time around. And GRASP is not doing anything about trade. And the IUCN primate section on great apes is not doing anything about great ape trade. And this has to change if we're going to start to be able to do something about trade. Uh, pretty much all the other exotic animals that go into the, these wildlife parks and the pet trade, they have working groups in CITES. There's no great apes working group. And I've been fighting to get one for quite some time, but uh, just haven't been able to do it. Next slide, please. And this is the report where you can find out in more detail about the things I've been talking about here and some of the things that we'll be talking about today in this uh, webinar. Quite a bit got edited out. Uh, where I named names and showed photographs for fear of uh, legal action. So it's a, a bit of a watered down report, but you'll get the general idea. So thank you very much. And let's turn it back over to Ian. Thank you, Dan. Um, as I say, it's a bit like poking a stick into an ant's nest. Wait to see what, what transpires. But what you outline is a, a very picture with different sections, let's say, like a triptych. Unfortunately, we have speakers who can speak to each of those sections. Um, let me first of all uh, invite Ophir to say a few words, because clearly this is evidence of a, a lack of enforcement success. And Ophir, first in Cameroon and then across a dozen or so African countries has helped to stimulate law enforcement action by providing some of the expertise, the motivation, and the skills to achieve successful prosecutions and then publicizing them so that the criminals know that they can no longer act with impunity. So Ophir, say a few words about how you got into this um, and 
and what your re response is to Dan's report. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, when we got into the arena, we've seen a huge gap in enforcement. Um, where we went and the countries we started uh, cooperating with, uh, we started bringing prosecutions of the illegal um, um, trade in great apes. And definitely uh, uh, it exposed to us how much more organized uh, and criminal this business is. Um, so I, I will say a little bit about, about the illegal trade itself and try to kind of like complement the introduction to the report from uh, from Dan about how criminal it is and also definitely talk about corruption and the gaps about corruption because that's really the underlying cause of everything we're talking about. Corruption, corruption, and corruption. Um, so a little bit about about the the, the the level of organization of the illegal illegal trade. Um, Dan was giving uh, a kind of a historical uh, review of how it transpired, but it's really important to um, uh, to clarify again that the, 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 where we are at right now is that we have um, uh, very organized transnational groups that are doing illegal trade in great apes in, 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 in alarming magnitude. Um, individuals that are that are, have been ex uh, uh, illegally exporting hundreds and sometimes thousands of uh, great apes as individuals, um, crime families that are spread all over Africa and outside. Um, Dan was touching a little bit about, about that aspect of the collaboration that there is between traffickers, between even uh, criminal rings, different criminal rings that we would assume would compete with each other. Um, you find a chatter uh, and communication between them on exchanging uh, stocks as those chimps are being stocked, um, exchanging permits from veterinary permits to definitely situs permits and exchanging points of exit. That is not restricted, this is not restricted to, uh, to Africa itself as the level of organization and the level of kind of concentration um, uh, centralization of this exists also in the outside. We have examples from different countries where you see that the same kind of system, um, the same kind of system is there. Uh, so we're talking about a uh, real kind of monopoly of, of those who are able to get the advantage. And that is definitely a driver. Um, so our story is not starting in the forest. It starts with crime criminals, big money, and how they generate more and more killings of, of great apes. And I think the big why uh, is not about enforcement as it is about corruption. Uh, our fight against, uh, our fight for wildlife law enforcement has led us directly towards corruption uh, because that's the main obstacle. And corruption, uh, uh, takes different levels. Maybe the more simple level is that um, almost as a rule, any criminal who is getting um, these amounts of money uh, and growing its business exponentially, that's how usually what we, we can see, uh, is immediately buying his own impunity. Buying impunity is not paying a border control um, off. That's not the kind of corruption we're talking about, even in the basic level. The basic level is that a part of your organization, you have people of power that are um, a part of your criminal business uh, and therefore lending you, um, lending you uh, protection, lending you impunity. Uh, and that is the basic level of, uh, of corruption of businesses that are or criminal organizations that are they're well protected because of, of that. And the next level of corruption is where actually um, the highest officials that are in charge of um, any kind of um, wildlife in their countries are becoming the main corporate themselves. And of course, they are advantaged. 
So as they are in the center of all the criminal activities, they figure out, well, I can be the, the head of the pyramid. I can be the chief, the chief trafficker, the chief criminal. And this is happening, still is the case in many countries. Um, even, even last month, we got more evidence to that on one of our arrest operations, but this is, um, and maybe the highlight uh, case uh, for that or the poster boy of that is, is Dumbuya, who has been the management authority and in charge of the wildlife, um, wildlife of his country uh, and has been that main criminal one and has been doing jail time. Um, so that is something that was achieved, but I can say clearly there are several management authorities that are criminals as we know, and, and we hope will get to jail where they belong. So the status, uh, um, Dan mentioned different organs that are not doing a lot, um, but I think that, that CITES is for me a main culprit and a problem. Because CITES is a UN convention and can either control the illegal trade and combat it or become basically a, a rubber stamp taking something that may be illegal and legalizing it. So in other words, CITES may be more of a loophole than a, a tool to protect wildlife, which is often the case. Um, so from, from being a tool to protecting wildlife, it's actually a, 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 a tool for traffickers. And what do you do when the government officials in charge of CITES are themselves the criminals? That is where there is a huge uh, problem. And, and CITES itself is, is reluctant to deal with that. So for me, one of the major problems that we have in fighting corruption, combating corruption, is where, um, is where we have um, CITES not dealing with a problem uh, efficiently and trying to avoid confrontation uh, and trying to avoid the big problem that we have, corruption in CITES, CITES uh, management authorities um, and, and basically harboring um, criminal businesses as a part of the convention. And that is for me a, a major problem. So I was trying to touch a little bit about the, the level of criminality um, and, and a little bit about corruption. There's so much more, uh, which I would hope that we'll get more uh, questions um, on in discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ophir. Um, never want to be afraid of uh, poking another ant's nest. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is worth saying that that um, international organizations, uh, particularly UN-led international organizations, uh, depend on the, the the motivation and the attitude of the participant countries. And when when we live in a, a globalized society, it is very hard. We don't have a global police force. We have Interpol, but Interpol can't act without being invited by the National Police Force. And if there are elements in the National Police Force who are criminal, then before Interpol gets there, they put out the word saying Interpol are coming. It is very difficult to break through even just one or two corrupt individuals to arrest people um, in those circumstances. So I, I don't want to point the finger at CITES and say they're to blame. <clears throat> CITES has 180 odd countries signed up to it, and most of them have civil servants who are doing their job. But you're right that it's very difficult to root out corrupt individuals in a system that big. Um, but talking about globalization, clearly the internet has amplified this problem because it gives we are a hierarchical species. Most primates are. We want to know who is the alpha male, the alpha female, and, and methods of displaying your status are to a large extent what's behind the trade in exotic pets. Because if you've got an exotic pet on your profile picture, some people think you're cool. Now, most of the participants and, and uh, attendees in this webinar would probably think the opposite. If you're posing with an exotic pet, you're probably saying, I support organized crime and the murder of rangers and customs officers with my smart pet or my ivory ornament, whatever bit of wildlife you're displaying. But getting that 
change across the internet is difficult when even the platforms are very slow to take down offensive um, content that shows that criminality has been involved. So Patricia, you've been involved initially with cheetah of trade and, and now with primates and other species. Would you like to say a few words about how the, the social media platforms exacerbate, but also how they might present an opportunity to tackle this problem? Yes, yeah, thanks. Uh, well, I should start by saying that um, I, I, I've been monitoring uh, illegal cheetah trade since 2005, but more or less in around 2012, we started seeing uh, social media, uh, Instagram, for example, becoming very popular and also the favorite platform for, uh, for illegal activities. Uh, including illegal wildlife trade. Um, <clears throat> this has, uh, as I'm a member of the Alliance for Campbell Crime Online, and uh, we have seen there all kinds of, you know, drugs, humans, except uh, antiquities. Uh, but wildlife in particular has been, uh, has been very popular because uh, like, like Ian said, People think that posing with uh, a baby chimp or a or a baby gorilla or a baby cheetah or a tiger, etc., it's cool and it probably makes them feel more manly. But the reality is that they are killing animals uh, and they are also um, supporting um, criminal criminals, uh, making them rich. Um, there's. There's different trends that have happened. Uh, unfortunately, social media, they say they're trying to do something. Uh, when you ask someone, for example, to take down a post of a person with a wild animal in a situation that is not natural, um, they might take it down, but uh, the dealers just close accounts, open new accounts, they don't care. And social media does not seem to be able to handle that or don't want to handle it because uh, you know every every click on a post produces also money for the for the social media platforms in advertising. Um, their algorithms actually direct you to potential uh, groups that also deal in animals in wild in wildlife. So social media is uh, is a problem. Um, I've seen lately a trend towards uh, not advertising. First, they started uh, not saying for sale. First, they were saying for sale uh, that such age, such price. Then they stopped saying that because of the pressure that we've been exercising on on uh, on sites, on the social media platforms. Uh, but now they use, uh, especially. Uh, in terms of you know very illegal activities, they're using Snapchat uh, where all the videos disappear in 24 hours. So it becomes almost impossible to monitor them. I try every day. I I spend at least an hour and I don't finish just looking at the accounts that I try to monitor for cheetahs or great apes. But also WhatsApp uh, has become a great way of killing because they send their videos of the animals to potential buyers who share them with other potential buyers, with other potential buyers. And it becomes, um, for sure, they, they almost end up uh, selling them. Uh, unfortunately, now there is even like a great age supplied on order. Uh, so if people want to buy a Bonobo, they will just contact the dealer and the dealer will contact someone in the DRC and the DRC is gonna go get the Bonobo. Uh, we've had very sad incidents uh, of uh, animals that were ordered by potential buyers. Uh, for example, eight chimps were being shipped from somewhere in Africa, we couldn't identify the, the route into the United Arab Emirates. Uh, eight of six of the chimps, there were eight, six of the chimps died uh, at the airport in Istanbul because the trade was detained there for three days. Um, 
Another one died on arrival in Dubai and only one survives today. It has not been confiscated. It's in the hands of a private owner. And as Dan said, the private sues that obtained licenses after um, a new law was enacted in the Emirates banning the private ownership of exotic pets. Um, they license people who had already animals and these people are using their licenses to then um, to, to exhibit the animals in their private zoos, to use them as props or selfies or, or people to go play with them. And then they're also, um, presumably they're selling them uh, under the guise of captive bread. So it's a whole uh, thing that entails corruption, that entails uh, lack of political will. Um, this has been brought up in multiple, multiple forums uh, with no, no results. Uh, so I think uh, I was just telling the panelists before we started that uh, it's nobody's fault. It's everybody's fault because we all have to work together. And, and we're not. Um, we try to, to approach authorities, we try to approach international organizations, we try to approach colleagues, et cetera. The trade is so difficult and the traffickers are so smart that it's very difficult to catch them unless there is a concerted effort on all sides. And I frankly don't see how that is going to happen. Um, social media, they, I'm sure they have, if they know what I'm looking at, you know, if I talk about buying a dress and then I find multiple ads about dresses, I'm sure they could also do something to, to create algorithms that can uh, identify pictures that are of wild animals with people in unnatural settings. Uh, so, um, we just have to keep trying, and that's what we've been doing for years. Um, I don't see an improvement. I see um, animals keep being trafficked, uh, more, more so since the last two or three years, in my opinion. So, um, so yes, we need to find ways in which we all can talk and not point fingers, but rather uh, see how we can work together and figure this out because it's not gonna end until the species end. Thank you. Very, very wise words, uh, Patricia. And it's important to note that those eight chimpanzees that you mentioned being trafficked, all of whom died except for one, each of those infants would be the result of probably at least two adults being killed. At least. And so that's three for every one. So three is a 24 chimpanzees. So for that one chimpanzee to get there, 23 others likely died, maybe more. Uh, I found the same when I was studying the gorilla uh, trade uh, back in 1989 in Congo, where the only person rescuing them was considered to be the most skilled person, but she lost four out of five because baby yeah. gorillas are, are even more fragile than baby chimpanzees. So again, you do the multiplication if each four out of five die, then one live infant rescue re represents 14 dead That's, in the, yeah, in the story. Yeah. We've had, so, had a bonobo died and Emirates. We've had gorillas. It's, yeah. Yes. When I think of the families that those babies are taken from and that they're likely killed, it's, it's even more terrifying. But the very important message that is coming out of this is that it's gone beyond these infants being a byproduct of clearing land for cultivation and killing the, the family or killing adults for, for meat or for medicinal or, or charms uh, and the babies are a byproduct. If these are organized criminal gangs with buyers in mind, they are ordering the killing of the adults to capture the baby. And that's a different situation. Uh, and it's one of which I don't think has been widely recognized. I, I've seen it because I've played the role of an ape, potential ape buyer, and I've talked to hunters and they would say, well, we'll get you one tomorrow. We'll just go out and, and get you a baby ape. And you know that that means, and you say, no, 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 I can't authorize that unless my boss, the mystery person who I'm supposedly representing gives the order. So don't do that unless ordered. Um, but if we are going to enforce these laws, 
then anyone holding a live animal needs to be arrested uh, if it's a, a protected species, and there needs to be somewhere to put that live animal. And this is where we come to you, Jenny, because you're at the sharp end. You're dealing with these orphans, bringing them back to health, and, and <clears throat> hopefully giving them a new lease of life, which, again, one hopes will involve repatriation to natural habitat so that they can have a life of being a garden of the forest, not sitting in a cage, dejected, um, or, or with friends playing, but out of it, out of their habitat. So, Jenny, tell me a little bit about your work. Tell the viewers a little bit about your work and, and how you see the results of Dan's report perhaps influencing your work. Um, thanks, Ian. Um, also, just want to thank the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime for doing this today, because I think it's significant that we are um, being focused on this. And thanks to Dan for the report. Um, I think it's very accurate. I don't think it's anything new to those of us who, who are doing this. Um, I look at the audience um, today. I see a lot of friends and colleagues. Um, but unfortunately, I think that's a little bit um, concerning for us that that's who's joining these calls. We're all, we're, we're kind of preaching to the choir here, I think a little bit. Um, and I think that's really one of the key issues. Um, I can talk a little bit about our rescue um, and give you some stats, but I really think the bigger picture is what I'd like to focus on, just like Ophir and Dan and Patricia focused on. Um, I think the importance is not, um, the chimps we're getting, of course, we want to give them a great life. We want to be there. Um, we are, I think, rescue centers. And I, again, I see some of my colleagues here. Um, really, I think we're at the center of all of this. And I think that's been uh, um, downplayed or maybe not a, not enough attention has been given to the key role that um, the rescue centers play, not only in allowing law enforcement um, and raising awareness and um, and giving a place to these individuals who are, of course, important, um, but I think we're really at the center of driving um, the strategies and understanding what's going on on the front lines um, to you know, to be a, a heavy contributor and an important contributor to stopping the killing of chimpanzees. Um, I think we're working much more. I, when I when I went into conservation and rescue, I, I don't think I had any idea how much um, focus I would be, uh, I would have on wildlife crime. It's, it's, it's a kind of all consuming. It's one of the most important things I do now. Um, and working with people like Ophir and his organization, and, and we have other organizations doing this kind of work to fight wildlife crime and great ape trafficking. Um, some of the touch points that have been mentioned, but I think are worth mentioning again, lack of enforcement, um, lack of awareness on what happens. Ian, you mentioned for every chimp we get, um, it's wonderful. We get them and we can give them a good life, but it means families were killed. Um, it means the trade is still going on. When we get a chimp, we know we are not finished doing our job. We're not even close. Um, we've received at Liberia Chimpanzee Rescue and Protection over 90 chimps in about five years. Um, our population is estimated in Liberia at about 7,000. Um, that's an old number. Um, if you look at the stats, we've, we've decimated almost 10% of our population potentially in such a short time, and we don't have time to waste. And so uh, I think this getting all of these peoples and or, people and organizations is is really critical. Um, where we're really lacking again is enforcement, but the main thing we're lacking them um, because we've had about um, probably a third of those confiscations have led to arrests, um, but those only have turned into about ten to fifteen percent of convictions. And even on the convictions, we're talking about small time criminals. Um, uh, it's not for lack at this point in in Liberia. We've made it quite clear that it is illegal. Um, to hunt, kill, eat, capture, keep uh, chimpanzees or great apes or other protected wildlife. Um, but the convictions are going to small time criminals. It's not the people who we have to really hit. We're not doing the investigations we need to do. We're not gathering the, the, the right intelligence the way we need to. Um, we're not hitting the key people. We're not getting the impact that we need to get. And I think that's why it's so critical that everyone on this panel and all of our related organizations and colleagues are working together. Um, I'd like to talk about the lack of seriousness, which I think has been touched on. I think by local um, leadership, 
by the public, um, by the international organizations and the global organizations. We talked about CITES, great apes weren't on the on the agenda. We, we got to talk about them a little bit, but really was not the focus and it should be um, just as high up as all the other um, issues that we were facing at CITES. Um, we have to face corruption um, as been mentioned. And I think as Ophir said, this is one of our biggest, biggest um, battles is fighting corruption. And it's the hardest battle, I think. Um, I think Ophir is accurate. It's it's the biggest and the hardest. Um, and when we talk about, um, I think we have a lack of coordination, lack of communication, a lack of shared um, systems and networks within our groups and our, our um, collaboration. But we also um, are fighting against, I think, when we talk about the criminals, they have better communications and coordination. They have better systems and networks than we do. So I think we have to catch up with them if we can. Um, I think everyone sitting here would, I hope would agree with me that that while we're all trying very hard, I, I think we have a lot more work to do to become as sophisticated as the criminals are. Um, unfortunately, they're, they're always a step ahead of us. Um, and uh, just back to rescue centers just and, and rescue organizations. Um, I'd like to just put a plug in there because I think, I hope that more attention will be paid to um, the opportunity um, to work with organizations uh, like ours because I think we know where the chimps are. We know where the criminals are. We know the intelligence. I get reports every single day, not only in Liberia and West Africa, but international reports every single day. People send me online, um, you know, social media posts, people selling chimps, uh, selling other great apes, selling other wildlife. Um, we have a lot of uh, ability to um, play a very big role in um, stopping the, the wildlife crime. Um, and I think, uh, I hope, I feel like we've, we've been able to expand our role in that. Um, we've been able to get a lot of support in that. And in Liberia, in just about a little over five years, We've got, uh, we're lobbying for a much stronger law. It'll be one of the strongest in West Africa and possibly all of Africa. Um, we have no commercial trade allowed at all in our country. Um, and we've gotten a, two new, new units set up in our country to fight this. Um, we're coordinating with international organizations. We've gotten quite large scale grants to come in um, to help us fight wildlife crime and the other components that lead to wildlife crime. Um, so I think if you can see in a, in a little over five years, um, if, if that kind of focus and energy and passion and commitment and coordination and collaboration could happen in all the other countries where um, we're seeing these crimes committed, I think we could make an impact. I, I like to stay a little optimistic. It's, it's very hard, as all of us know, to be optimistic when you have chimps flowing in, um, other wildlife flowing in, gorillas, great apes, and we're still seeing it all over the place. Um, and, you know, I think we have to have a zero tolerance at all levels from front lines all the way up to um, organizations like CITES and, and globally. Um, and, uh, yeah, I won't, I won't go on too much long, longer. I think we have a, we all have so much to say. Um, the only last thing I'd love to touch on, and I won't say it myself right now, but it may be, be something that we could all talk about um, if we have time on the panel, is that I think the legal trade, and Dan, you talked about um, seeing the chimps on social media, um, seeing uh, zoos and safari parks, a lot of those are legal. Um, and they may not be taking chimps from the wild. They are. They are illegally taking chimps or other great apes or other wildlife um, from wild spaces. But we also have illegal trades in Europe and the U.S. We have perfectly legal uh, wildlife parks and people can take selfies with great apes. Um, they can, as long as they're bred, captive bred, and it's all licensed. Um, I think it's a huge contributor to the work we're doing. And I think it uh, makes it very difficult for us to message, um, whether it's social media or in the political arena, um, to take this seriously. When we see people about, you know, uh, videos every day of chimps uh, vacuuming houses and eating spaghetti and cooking and in clothing and jumping around acting like they're silly when really we see that they're actually in fear um, and they are being mistreated. And so I think that also fuels the illegal trade. Um, so I think we all have to fight very hard to not allow legal trade in great apes as well.
Thank you, thank you, Jenny. Uh, it, it is true that, that every one of us can play that role. And for a time in the April Lions, we were reckon, recommending people um, comment on those vi videos and posts with something like hashtag cruel, not cute. Um, but it's been pointed out to us that actually the more comments, positive or negative, the better as far as the algorithm is concerned. So it's better not to comment, but to complain to the platform. And we have had a number of NGOs working together have had talks with Meta uh, who have guidelines that you would think would preclude certainly overt cruelty to animals, and yet they're very slow to take down such posts. And when they pop up again somewhere else, it's, it's the activists who track them down and report them. And as someone has just commented in the, in the chat box, it shouldn't be that hard to have algorithms that draw out these, these uh, criminals. And given that particularly the ones who are selling the, the apes, for crying out loud, they're holding up their phone number. How hard is it for an enforcement agency to set up a sting and arrest well, them? And, and you know, Ian, I think that the, the, the trade, the platforms, first of all, I don't think they take it seriously enough. But I also think that if something is happening legally, they won't take it down. So we see cruelty and we see the messaging that it's cute and funny to have chimps or uh, orangutans and take selfies with them. Many of those are legally happening in our own country of the United States. Um, and the Social media platforms won't take those down because they are perfectly legal. Those those chimps have been bred in in the U.S. And so as long as even if they're being treated <laughs> cruelly. So I think that's something we all need to really make as a top priority here as well, because if it's happening legally, as we know, it's going to be very hard to shut it down illegally as well. But we do have well, they, don't even, they don't even take down the illegal ones. I mean, they're selling openly selling great apes on Facebook. Instagram, they do not take it down. And let's face it, those legal pictures are encouraging the legal trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have legislation going through Parliament in the UK, both on the keeping of primates um, as, as pets, which is being outlawed. But sadly, there is a clause that allows expert keepers to continue to keep primates as pets. It's seldom apes in the UK, it's usually smaller primates. Um, and also there's a thing called the online safety bill, which is designed to protect, protect children. But there's a huge push with MPs and lords and, and many NGO lobbyists trying to get animal cruelty in there too, uh, because often cruelty to animals is associated with people who are cruel to children or spouses. So th there is room there for changes in legislation country by country. But we're dealing with an international problem. And as was observed, those the perpetrators particularly those who actually want the most expensive exotic pets because they see that as a, a symbol of their status. They are people with wealth and influence and they can pull the strings of power across the world. And that's what we're up against. So it is a, a serious problem. Um, and, and if in identifying that problem, we focus people's attention on it. Um, do any of you have a, a, a brief summary of what solutions you would like to see Right now, you know the, the low-hanging fruit. What one by one? Jump in as as you feel uh, moved <laughs> to do so. But what do you think would actually change some of this? Collaboration, in my opinion, collaboration, but also with authorities. It's very hard as a as a civil person to report a crime and be heard. For example. Yeah, Patricia, that's such, I would say the same. First of all, collaboration, coordination. We need to coordinate our efforts. Like I said, the criminals are ahead of us. Um, we need to, we really need to get down and dirty here and talk about with every one of us and, and those of us on the front lines with those of you who are, you know, looking at, at more of the global, um, global, you know, policies and, and trafficking routes and things like that. But also I think you're, you're right, Patricia, we, we really need to, um, the seriousness and the political will, there needs to be an immense amount of pressure on leadership in the countries of origin as well as the countries where the demand is to make a statement and say, we will not tolerate this. There's zero tolerance for this in our country. There is zero tolerance for us 
to receive these um, you know, individuals in our countries. So I think the pressure on that high level of politics and then the pressure within the origin countries to say we don't we won't tolerate it. Um, and that comes from leverage, of course, we all know funding, international pressure. Um, you know, what do I get out of that? You know, why should I put my focus and priority on that? And I think um, that takes all of us putting um, this as a priority and making sure that we are speaking to the powers that be, uh, because we can do all the work we're all doing. And if these governments don't decide to stop it, and the agencies within the governments who are responsible for enforcing laws or raising awareness or um, influencing the behavior of um, the people in those countries, we won't we won't stop it. Um, because we, we need that to be successful. Well, look, for the forum for doing that is CITES. I mean, that is the international forum. 183 countries are represented there, and they are the ones who make decisions regarding action to stop illegal trade. You know, we can see what's being done for elephants, for rhinos, all kinds of other species. Those actions are in place for great apes within CITES. Right now, that's about the only international, you know, really uh, important uh, centralized international international forum we have for great ape trade. Obviously, I mean, that they deal with international trade of fauna and flora. So that is the place to talk about it. But it's not being talked about. I, I think that for my... Um... For my side of things, uh, I think we need to change the language. Um, the language of discussions and having buy-ins from governments and, and political will here and political there and another big conference that we have, we've been there for a while. Um, you know me, I have three things on my mind that is for me the major issue here. One is corruption, the second is corruption, the third one is corruption. Uh, we're talking about delegates that some of them are criminals themselves. We are talking about communicating yeah. with high officials and officials, <laughs> which are, are the criminals. We know it. We are working on the subject. Yeah. We see them right now, doing yeah. it right now. So unless we change the, unless we, 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 we roll our sleeves up and say, listen, no, we change the language. We're not compromising again. We're not afraid to say it. We can't discuss with criminals about the crime. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's my take. You, you basically, uh, know it. Ian, yeah. I think that there's some more questions in the, in the chat. Maybe I can pick up on two of them. Uh, there are indeed... they're, not, they're not in the questions. They are in the chat. So yes, <laughs> can I pick on um, two? Some of them are for information with links. Um, Karen Kemp uh, has just written, how can we engage other wealthy people, celebrities to work against? and apply pressure, sort of peer pressure, um, to fight the criminal trade. And indeed, that's, uh, that is what a lot of us try to do. Um, it's sometimes hard to get a hold of them. I was disappointed to see some of the names in that slide you showed, Dan, of, of celebrities holding chimpanzees. Uh, and some of them are at the top of the A-list. So an image like that is very damaging if thousands of fans think that that's a cool thing to do. Um, but they're reachable. You know, there's a new channel called Ecoflix, which some of you will have come across. And we're trying to yeah, set yeah. a very high standard to, to do the right thing. And we want to attract celebrities who want to be seen to be doing the right thing. So I think if, if you could share that slide uh, privately, Dan, uh, I will have my celebrity connected friends reach out to some of those people and say, right, can you stand up and apologize for that and, and give a positive message about um, conservation and against the trade in apes and the keeping of exotic. And give a lot more than just those. <laughs> yes. Well, well, let's let's do that. We can do that as a, <laughs> as an alliance. We're all ape allies. Um, speaking of alliances, I wanted to mention uh, you know, Jenny's organisation is a part of PASA, the Pan African Sanctuaries Alliance, which provides a network for twenty three. Is it now sanctuaries across Africa? Um, in CITES, many organizations work under the SSN umbrella, the Species Survival Network, uh, which collectively lobbies on issues like these. Uh, but I guess despite all that, and some of us have been doing it for decades, we're not winning. 
So uh, I saw some very defensive comments in, in the chat, and I, I saw today a, a response from the IUCN private specialist group um, saying, we're, we're doing lots. And I agree. And, and as we've all been doing lots for decades, we're in this situation today. We have to recognize that the lots we've been doing has not been sufficient to deal with the scale of the problem. And that given these new opportunities on, on social media, for both trade and for displaying your status, we have to step up our game, not think we're doing lots, that's enough. Because it clearly not it isn't, otherwise you wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, there's just, if I may, just add two more elements in, which are of huge global concern at the moment. One, of course, is public health. We've just come through a pandemic and the trade in wildlife is recognized to be one of the issues around that. Sometimes a direct cause, sometimes just a risk, which may or may not lead to a new pathogen jumping species. But because apes are our closest living relatives, they potentially can carry pathogens that can affect humans and vice versa. Our human diseases can infect great apes. And there is a huge amount of money available publicly to combat the, the, the disease risk. So that's an opportunity, and I know that many organizations are trying to influence the uh, proposed instrument uh, that the World Health Organization is drawing up uh, on pandemic prevention and, and dealing with pandemics, but it's only because of NGOs and, and some of the animal uh, NGOs that prevention got into the title. And prevention is better than cure. So that's an opportunity for us to hit a, a, an audience of people who aren't on this call because they're not particularly interested in illegal wildlife trade but they are interested in public health and particularly their own and their children's public health so let's not miss that trick the other one of course the other global issue of concern is climate change and as you all know you'd be disappointed if i didn't talk about how important apes are as gardeners of the forest dispersing seeds pruning trees creating light gaps they are the gardeners that keep the forests healthy and the forests are what will stabilize our climate. We cannot win the fight against dangerous climate change without the tropical forests and across Africa and Southeast Asia, it's apes and, and globally it's primates and the non-human primates that are the gardens of those forests. And that too is an important reason. An ape taken out of its habitat is effectively unemployed, perhaps for 50 years if it lives that long or perhaps for a few miserable years if it dies young. But the, the impact of removing each individual ape from a forest is measurable. And that forest is less efficient as a result. And that difference provides a way of bringing resources to protect them. Because if you keep the apes and the elephants and the other keystone species in those ecosystems, we benefit from those ecosystem services. And that's the other big initiative that I want you to check out is Rebalance Earth. And that's the website, rebalance.earth. I won't say more about it here, but the consequence of illegal wildlife trade isn't just the suffering of the individual animals in trade, it's the loss of those animals from the habitat that we need to stabilize our climate. And all these issues are coming together in this one talk. So um, we, we, I was looking for easy ways forward. We've got collaboration, of course, very important. And all the people who are feeling that they've been attacked in Dan's report needs to recognize the, the report is attacking all of us because we have collectively failed. So let's yeah, get Ian, heads can, I, can I just say, uh, we, we talked about this, the panelists, I think uh, personally, I mean, we we feel like we're failing all the time. I mean, we don't, I, I don't, I, I would hope that people wouldn't take this as a criticism. Um, I would take it more as a call to action. Um, every time we see another chimp, we know we haven't stopped killing of chimps. Um, so, you know, that that for us is a failure. And, and I think um, we don't have to say failure in a negative sense. We have to say it in a way that says, hey, we're still failing. That means we need to do things better. We need to work better, smarter, harder, um, collaborate more, coordinate better. Um, we need to get up to the level of the criminals and be able to stop it. And I think what you talked about, Ian, I, not to minimize all of the other aspects, because I think we're talking about trafficking today, but yes, this is about all of the different components that we need to focus on um, to, to save our great apes, whether that's from trafficking 
to um, biodiversity, you know, biodiversity preservation, to conservation, to awareness, to behavior change. Um, it's across the board. We have to keep doing all of it. There's nothing that we that we can stop doing. But I think for, for the trafficking piece, it sounds like everybody here is saying um, better coordination and collaboration. And I think our biggest um, hit is the political will and corruption. Um, and, you know, we like to call it interference in Liberia and and I, you know, I keep saying I, I can't use the word interference. I'm sorry, but we're talking about corruption here. You know, there's a phone call. We can do everything in our power. We know where the chimps are. We know where they're being killed. We know the networks. We know where they're crossing borders. And we're as long as there is not enough political will to say we have zero tolerance for this. And as long as there is corruption at high levels in governments, whether that's local government leadership or whether that's global or regional, um, it will be very hard to stop. No matter what what resources and training and capacity building and awareness and um, messaging we do, uh, when we have top level people who don't want to stop this, it won't stop. And I'd, I'd also like to bring up poverty um, because unfortunately, most of the times uh, the people that sell a cheetah or a chimp, I don't know for how much, a hundred dollars or fifty they get arrested, but the, <clears throat> the big fish, they don't get arrested. Now, these people live, my experience is in the Horn of Africa, Somalia, Ethiopia. Uh, they live in countries where uh, there is no tourism because it's dangerous. So uh, if you try to look for alternative livelihoods, there aren't too many options. Uh, if you tell them that their wildlife can attract tourism, you know, that's gonna take years to happen and it needs to be a safe environment. So there also need to be uh, efforts to, to look for uh, alternative livelihoods for these people because they're, many of them are doing it out of hunger. A policeman in Somaliland might make $50 a month and, that, and he has to feed his, uh, his family with that. And if a dealer offers him $2,500 to let him smuggle eight cheetahs, he's going to take it. So uh, somebody brought up that in the in the chat page. And I think poverty is another thing, poverty alleviation. And I, I don't know how to do that without a lot more. I wanted to- Can we uh, let some of the people in balance? the chat? Yeah, Come that, that is one of the, because... that is the questions. That is one of the questions. And I, I, was, I also wanted to- to refer to it maybe from a different uh, direction than, than Patricia. Um, uh, yeah, the question referred to issues of poverty and, and so on, but I want important sources and, and I want to, uh, to offer a different perspective on this. Um, we do not see in any place right now eating gorillas as a protein uh, source in, in the village. Not at all. First, it is just a minor part of the of the bushmeat that you have in the biomass. It's a fraction. And secondly, you would be completely stupid to eat it when you can uh, uh, make a profit of ten times that kind of uh, level. So I think it's a it's a myth. The idea that the gorilla is a protein resource is 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 ridiculous right now. There is an illegal trade that is flourishing. But it's also ridiculous because it doesn't start with a poor villager going around to the forest and trying to get something to eat and landing on a gorilla. It just doesn't start. The story doesn't start from there. Um, the, 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 the person who was asking this and giving this comment is from DRC. So I'll give that in that kind of, uh, in that kind of context. In that context, you are a villager and you have the mayor or the police commissioner coming in your area and saying, here's the money. Go and do it. It's a flourishing trade and it's protected. It's not something sporadic that people are just going around and eating. It's a criminal activity that is very well organized. So I, that's my kind of like take take on that. Um, I, you know, Patricia gave the examples of Somaliland. That's an extreme situation. But in any case, the problem starts with the people with money. What generates this illegal trade is money. It's not the poor. The poor are just being used. I agree and the with prices you, are beer. going up. The I agree prices with you, have gone it, I, We find that very frustrating that people keep thinking it's because of people needing food or people being poor. Um, yes, of course, poor people are exploited in a criminal network. I agree, Patricia, which I think is your point. Um, but yeah, these are criminals. This is happening and it's being allowed to happen 
by politicians and governments and heads of agencies and um, whether that's local or global. This is not, um, I think it's, a, it's, it's the wrong, I think it's the wrong um, direction to take as Ophir is saying, um, if that's what we think the source is, we could give all the alternative livelihoods tomorrow. We could we could feed every single person in Liberia and make sure they had everything they needed and we would still have this crime. But if I was going to arrest anybody, it's the man side. Oh, of I course. So, yeah. Of course, because because corruption has that kind of effect of hurting the poor most. And that includes enforcement. Corrupt enforcement has that effect, and you can see this statistically very easily. Um, Ian, I see that somebody is asking the same question two times and not being answered. Can I um, say yes, a word about it's, it's, that? I'm trying to read both the Q&A and no, the Okay, I, I can pick it up. Um, go, <laughs> it's go about for dogs. It, if you it's, can answer it's, it. about, it's about dogs. I wanted to answer it on the first time. Uh, what about detection dogs? They are not corrupted. Uh, they can be used. Uh, what I want to say is that if only detection was our problem, detection is not our problem. As you can see from some of the interventions here, we're talking about sometimes quite in the open. We see the criminals, we see high officials criminals in some of the countries. It's wide open for everybody to see, and yet nothing happens. So if you could see an ape getting uh, sold online in front of everyone, uh, detection is not a problem. I will just give a small example of why it's not a problem is that whenever I'm asked about it, I'm giving an example of um, a small animal that was uh, um, that was smuggled um, without anybody seeing in the from the port of Douala to um, uh, to Pakistan, and that is a hippo, a hippo on an Ethiopian allies flight. Detection is not a problem. You can see the hippo. You can see the apes. Um, it's quite in the open. Anybody in an airport can actually uh, tell you this. So the dogs cannot be corrupted, but the people who are handling the dogs can be highly corrupted as anything that can go in an airport or a seaport. Um, and Andre has made some very pertinent comments in the, uh, in the chat um, about the role of poverty. Of course, poverty is important because where there is poverty and unemployment, it makes fertile ground for criminal gangs to go in and buy a few beers for young men and, and say, well, we need some lads to help carry tusks or baby gorillas or whatever it is that they're going into the forest uh, to kill. Um, and that is why I'm hopeful that the, the payment for ecosystem services that pays people to keep animals alive in the forest can counter that. But as long as there is a demand, there will be people trying to meet that. And, and that's, again, where, where we have to really work on the wealthy and appeal to their better side so that they can be seen as, as environmental heroes rather than villains. And that is very much something that social media can do. So everyone who has a following, um, or, or even those who don't have a following but can can tag people who do have a following, who agree with it, our perspective, can call out the stars who have done something stupid because presumably they either, often it's people who like animals. And they say, oh yes, I love animals. That's why I want a picture of me holding an animal. And the more exotic, the more impressive it looks. And it's that, that perverted um, desire to be seen as an animal lover that, that um, unwittingly in the case of the ignorant people or deliberately if it's people who, who actually just try to make money out of it, um, result in this, this growth in the trade. Um, it, it is a complex problem though. And, and the, the chat, I don't know if we have the ability to save the chat, but if, if you go to the three dots in the right hand corner at the bottom uh, and click save chat, you can read it and there are links in there which are w worth following up on. And I thank all those who have continued a discussion in the chat while we're trying to have this one. There were two actual Q&As. There was another Ian, question. Yeah, just, yeah, there's two. Ian, I there's just wanted question. to, um, this is Jenny, I wanted to, Andre, I know you've had a lot of comments in here and I appreciate those. Um, and I think, um, I think, I know we're saying that, that this isn't a matter of people being starving and eating the apes. Um, I know that is, of course, happening, but 
um, most of the the meat that's that's from great apes, in, in at least in in our experience, is more of an elite kind of crowd of people. It gets generally imported out. Um, there aren't many people in Liberia who actually would like to eat chimps, um, but it does get sent out. That's another criminal network. But I did want to address you, Andre, and just say that. Um, I hope it doesn't sound like we aren't working with local communities because that is what all of us do um, every single day. We are very close within our communities. We work we work very, very closely with um, community groups and heads of communities and, and chiefs and leadership. Um, and it is an essential role we play. We play. I think um, it's not so much in terms of, we do of course talk about livelihoods and what Ian said about having other, other mo means of uh, income and also so other other reasons to value the great apes. Um, but we do work with the communities. I think the zero tolerance that I speak of has to come from communities as well. But the zero tolerance also has to be that we will not tolerate corruption. Um, we will not tolerate um, a police officer who's taking a bribe to allow a chimp to go through a checkpoint. Um, we won't allow our community member to kill and, and sell, you know, a thousand pangolins and, and their scales. Um, we, so it is critical that we work with communities, but again, it has to come into, we are deciding this is not tolerate tolerant for us. We won't tolerate it. And we will all work together at all levels, whether it's an individual in a community, all the way up to um, the head of CITES. Uh, we won't tolerate it and we will focus on it and it will be a serious, um, a serious issue for us to, um, to stop. I, I think there are two Q&A. Sure. Yeah, Patria. Sorry. Yeah, there are two Q&As and I can definitely answer very quickly the second one. Uh, it, basically, the question is, is there uh, a convergence between wildlife trafficking from Latin America with other parts of the world? There definitely is. <clears throat> I know, I know dealers who are sending chimps to Venezuela in exchange for monkeys from the New World to going to, to the other part of the world. So there's definitely a, a convergence in that kind of trafficking. Uh, and uh, there's indications that there is convergence also with drugs, wildlife yeah. and drugs. Lucia, hmm. we'd like to answer the same questions. Uh, so I'll give I'll give also my take because it's also uh, it's also it's also raising the issue of what happens when corruption is rising. When corruption yeah. is rising, do we have more more crime? And the answer is, is equivocally yes. Every study ever that looked at issues of of corruption, a, 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 a crime correlates that with indexes of corruption, like for example the transparency uh, perception. Um, corruption perception index. Uh, Etis was doing that uh, several times and trying to look at uh, it is uh, with 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 with, uh, with illegal trade in, in ivory, trying to look at the data and try to see what correlates with that more. What is changing? And the only one um, uh, one uh, indicator that is the most correlating with that was transparency national uh, corruption uh, uh, perception index. So we can see that as well in different countries when there is a rise in global, uh, um, in global corruption that has nothing to do with wildlife, we see the illegal trade is rising. So definitely. I wanted to say one more thing uh, because I keep on hearing two words that gives me an allergy. So if you see me uh, getting uh, shivers each time, it's because I read or I hear you saying the words political will. And I hate this concept. I find it, I find it as, as an instrument, an instrument to our context of international development, NGOs, et cetera, that removes from us responsibility. As if there is, a, there is something up there that is called political will, either it is there, either it's not there, we keep on doing our work and we're hoping that it will fall from the sky one time. It doesn't. Corruption doesn't work this way. When you look at things from a corruption lens, there is no such thing as political will. There's no will not to be corrupt or yes, corrupt or how it is, or somebody wakes up in the morning and decides to be nice to great apes. That's not how politics works. That's not how the world works. There is a real problem. It is real. It's not above us. It's not for somebody else. It's corruption. 
And we are able to fight it right now. There are tools to fight it. We just have to focus on that. We just have to focus well with what is difficult, with the actual uh, point of conflict. Um, and, and maybe not be nice, and maybe get into a real conflict, uh, but do it. But I think political will is just a trick to remove everybody from responsibility. It's our responsibility, each one of us, to fight this corruption, to speak up, uh, and have the courage to to to, uh, to to deal with that. And I think that if we'll have more and more people who will be tackling that root cause um, courageously, we can actually uh, make a difference and we don't have to wait for anybody to bring some will from the skies to, uh, to criminals. Thank you, Ophir. Um, Jason Gilchrist, uh, hi Jason, uh, asks, are great apes a unique problem by view of the charismatic status? And so do we need new and different solutions compared to other wildlife? My, my first take on that is, is that the more prestigious an exotic animal appears, the higher, the, the, the wealthier, the more powerful the person that wants to have one. And that does create a, a problem because those people are often very well connected politically, are uh, difficult to prosecute and seem to be able to act with impunity. If they want an ape from Africa, they send their private jet to pick it up. They don't need to worry about CITES if they can find a, a, an obscure airstrip and, and land their own plane. And we know of cases where that's happened. But I've also heard of investigators who have uh, come across vehicles driving across Africa to the best export country, um, crossing land borders multiple times, presumably with $50 here, $50 there, just to ease their progress. And, and so even low-tech vehicle transport is, is used to get apes from one part of Africa to another and into the export market. Uh, any of you want to comment on that? Do we need a special um, method for apes or, or is it just the same for cheetahs and big cat, other big cats um, that are in, in, in the trade? Well, I just think it's a matter of popularity. I mean, what who get, what gets the attention? Elephant, rhino, pangolin now, uh, tigers. They're, they're the ones that get the attention and the money. So uh, I'm not saying they don't deserve it. They're, they're important species, but uh, I guess they're considered sexy and, and, and they're easier to deal with. Uh, somebody was asking if, if the great apes could be uh, marked, I guess, like ivory. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess you would need a lot of money to go to all the... Uh, all the, places the, the technology where they live exists and... to to identify individuals yeah. from their DNA. Okay, but, but what we're about to get, and, and there are various groups working on this, um, is facial recognition software for apes. And once we have that, it won't be a case of you know what species is it. Well, who is it? Which chimpanzee? Because it, it, camera traps in the wild are recording images of apes. Once we get the the software to be able to say this is a known individual. And this is her son or daughter. If that infant ape ends up in trade, we'll know who it is. And all it needs is an enforcement officer with a, a, a camera phone to take a picture and upload it. But we're not quite there yet. So at the moment, it is difficult to say who is in trade when, when you see a confiscated. But we, we, ape. Know, we know we we know who's in trade. Bit, let me offer a bit. Let me offer a bit of a, of a different perspective on the issue. Yeah, Ophir, just I let think... me just say this up here though. Let, we I I want you to touch on this please what you're going to say we know where the chimps are coming from we know where the apes are coming from we know who they are we know the hot spots we don't need to recognize them on the other end we need to stop them where they are and i don't think we need any kind of technology not to say that can't help us but i don't think we need technology to stop it because we know where it's happening i mean no fear knows best of all we we, we need to stop the corruption and we need to stop people deciding that this is not a serious issue I, I think that the technical issues are, are not as important. I mean that, yes, there, there are ways already that are not being used, including apes that are being tagged, that can be tagged and then seen later on. 
Uh, it's quite uh, it's quite easy, but that's not where the problem lies. It's not a technical problem. Okay, I wish there was a lot of a lot of the audience and 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 uh, and I think some of us that are from within the system, I would say, um, have as a reflex a capacity building issue. Just get the next trick. Unfortunately, building governance is different from building capacity. It's far more complicated. But my point is that not only that, you know, some of the tools that we have are not a part of the system. So if, if for example, Cytus would have put that um, as a requirement, that would be great if they put more and more of these requirements, but they don't. And there are different, there are different ways to identify other, other contrabands and are not being used and are not being a condition for the illegal trade. So CITES itself can make things far stronger, close loopholes for zoos, uh, get far stronger restrictions on uh, CITES management authorities, um, not tolerate issues of captive bread uh, just out of, uh, uh, out of uh, 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 not, very not, not even very sophisticated kind of lie. Uh, all this is in the face, we see it. And that is not being done. So trying to get it as a requirement, uh, any requirement would be good, but getting it uh, 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 on the on the trade is is not at all in the cards for scientists uh, for the scientists right now. But it, it would be if one of the parties were to raise it at the next um, animals or standing committee, um, so that it would be addressed at the next conference of the parties. It, it's not. Well, they have to be on the agenda. They're not exactly. on the agenda. And, and, and that's constructed <laughs> by the, the desires of the parties. So we each need to talk to our respective governments or, or our friendly ape range states to say, look, this report has identified a problem. You have it within your capacity to raise this and, and get it back on the agenda of CITES. It has been on the agenda of CITES, but it just hasn't succeeded yet. So we need to work harder. That's perhaps one easy take home message from, from this. Talk to your local CITES management authority and say, please raise this and get it back on the agenda uh, for the next COP. Yeah, they need to submit a document. <laughs> yes. I, I see another well, question. What's the NGOs here. that stimulate that, not individuals? So there have to be some, you know, want to take the issue up. I see another question there on the legal trade. I think that we've touched it already. Um, but yes, I would say definitely the legal trade in any kind of way has always in our experience been a cover for the legal trade. So any gray area, anything that is not clear cut is causing us huge problems of enforcement, huge especially yeah. when there's corruption within the governments. So it's very easy to do that retroactively and cover any legal activity as a legal one. Um, so yeah, the question is very much to the point, And I think we mentioned it before and I just emphasize again, the legal trade is a huge problem. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned that in my in my talk. I I, I can't I, we can't underestimate the the huge impact that illegal trade has on. It's it's not only a cover for illegal trade. Of course, we know that it also sends a message. Everybody watching chimps and orangutans with selfies and looking funny and wearing clothing um, that just diminishes so much of the work we're trying to do to talk about the seriousness of this. Um, and I think it also is very difficult to say to people in Liberia, to my, you know, to my fellow Liberians, um, you guys can't do all this and this is illegal and you guys should respect chimps and you should really think about um, how important they are to our ecosystem and biodiversity. And also, of course, to talk to the agencies and leadership about the importance of um, cracking down on illegal crime and commercial bushmeat and commercial trade um, when they can go right to the U.S. and see some man making, you know, a, a group of men making um, billions of dollars on uh, chimpanzees doing selfies and and being exploited all over social media. I, I think it's one of our biggest problems and we didn't touch that much on it today, but I think it's a whole other discussion to be had. I'm glad you raised it, Jenny. It is something that a number of NGOs are working on and uh, uh, well, 
there are signs. We had a meeting with Meta the other day, and, and they acted on some of the requirements that we were putting to them. Um, but it's it's maintaining that pressure. And I do think that, that every participant in this uh, has that opportunity of reporting uh, offensive content. And these days, um, offensive content is, is a it's a controversial point. One person's offensive content is another person's free speech. But here there is actual crime, actual cruelty to animals, both of which are contrary to Meta's guidelines and policies for contributors. So it is their duty to, to take them down. And if they're not taking them down, we need to call them out on it. Um, so that's something, again, we, we can all do. Um, our closing remarks, I think we must be uh, w winding up now because our, our audience has, has scarcely shrunk at all. So full marks for staying power, those of you who are still on, on the call, on, on the uh, webinar. But would, would any of you like to kick off the closing remarks? Dan, you, you kicked us off at the beginning. What, what are your thoughts from this discussion? Uh, before I give a summing up, I forgot to say one thing, and I think it's an important point, is that the prices of the great apes have been going up quite a bit recently, the last couple of years, in the destination countries. And this poses an even bigger problem because now there's there's even more incentive for the trade to continue, and it's going to be a lot more difficult to control it. And I'm not quite sure why the great apes seem to be more popular now in places particularly like the Gulf. Social Libya. media. Social media. Well, yeah, well, social media has been around for quite a long time. Uh, five years ago, when I was looking at social media prices, a chimp could get you at most thirty to $35,000 in the Gulf. Prices are up to $100,000 now for a chimp. Bonobos, two to $300,000. Gorilla up to over $500,000. I mean, it's getting to be ridiculous. And although hard data are very difficult to go come by because it's obviously a, uh, a, a secret trade, you know, it's undercover, uh, there seems to be higher rates of capture, more organized capture, particularly in the DRC. There's a lot going on in the DRC right now, going out much more organized than it was when I was looking at it uh, back when I was doing this other project, you know, 2014, 15, 16, 17. So the problem is getting worse. It's not getting any better. And sort of as part of a summing up, I'm just going to keep harping about CITES because that is the only forum we have. Now, I agree they're not a law enforcement agency. I mean, they have a law enforcement section to it but they do not have police. They can't go out and arrest people. But that is the forum where law enforcement is discussed in a centralized place where all the parties get the message. And CITES sends out through its resolutions and decisions, instructions of what parties are supposed to do. So CITES really is the only place where we can internationally do something about this. And of course, CITES of parties. So that brings in the, nat the national side of it. So that's really where the focus has to be. Thank you. Uh, any further thoughts from Patricia or Jenny or Ophir? I just want to say that uh, in agreement or not with, uh, with the report, uh, it's opening a discussion that it's important. And I hope uh, we can take it farther than just this, uh, this online seminar. Yeah, yeah thanks to everybody. I'll just say thank you. Thanks Ian for moderating and thanks to um, GITSC for having us. And I just, I guess to end, I, it doesn't feel very positive, I know for all of us, but I, to end on a positive note, I guess, I, I I really believe, I obviously think this is pretty much what I think about all the time, but I think if we all join forces, all hands on deck, 
pool our passion, because that's part of it, our commitment and our dedication, our expertise, our resources, our knowledge, um, the technologies we've talked about, and we all come together um, and we make a very serious network and collaboration and coordination of efforts, I do believe we can stop it. I really do believe we can stop it. Um, but it's going to take all of us and we're going to have to really, um, you know, come together. Um, and I know there was some con concern about some of the things in the report and people being concerned that they're being criticized. I don't think there's time to be worried about whether we're being criticized. I think we just have to go forward and say this is a huge, immense problem and we better tackle it now. Um, I don't, we don't have time to waste. Honestly, we do not have time. We, we can't, we won't be having this discussion in 10 years if we don't do something right now. Um, someone asked me once, uh, why am I seeing only the empty um, half of the glass? And I said, as an activist, I don't see the, the empty half and I don't see the full half. I just see what needs to be filled. And so I think that uh, from that, I'm not optimistic or not optimistic or pessimistic or not pessimistic. There is real work to do and we need to do it. I am uh, not under the opinion that we need to spread out and say, let's continue to try this multifaceted, so many different ways to solve the problem. I think we need to focus in what is the harder. Our instinct should be that where it's the hardest place to penetrate, that's what we need to fight and not the easy uh, or fluffy. And that's my take uh, on it. There's real hard work if we can concentrate in, in, in breaking that huge problem that is in front of us um, and, and focus on what is hard, not what is easy. Thank you all for those wise words. Um, I am a compulsive optimist, I can't help it. Sorry, we've got to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what just to, to close, uh, before this report, I wasn't really aware of GTOC, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. And at the beginning, I was, I was asking about it. It is an independent body. It's a network, a global network. And it's looking at drug smuggling, people smuggling, and the illegal wildlife trade. And the fact that this organization considers this to be an issue worthy of a report is significant. It's independent, it's not part of the UN, it's not gonna have any influence beyond the people who read it and think this is important, this organization has covered it. So that is in itself encouraging. And I thank Dan for his hard work in pulling this together and his, his courage of making some people feel uncomfortable. But the purpose of the report I'm used is to not that. to make people <laughs> feel uncomfortable, is to stimulate action. So that's what I hope we'll take away from this discussion. And for those of you who are still on, on the receiving end of our thoughts, uh, thank you for your um, persistence. <laughs> and I hope that you will share the recording of this with many people, in particular, CITES management authorities, um, CITES scientific authorities, and the secretariat. We'll see whether there's any formal response, because we're not trying to criticize organizations, we're trying to stimulate individuals within those organizations to do their job. And that's the most we can do as, as we indeed do our job. So thank you all. And uh, I bid you farewell. <laughs>